great. Thank you, Dan. So now we'll just have Jeremy give a presentation and, uh, and then we'll open up for questions. And I'd like to just recognize, Jeremy was with us. He was here this morning, but unfortunately he had to go back to, uh, to Montreal because he is a studious instructor, um, professor, and he has a lecture tonight. So um, he is Zooming with us now and he'll give his talk and then he'll be with his students um, later. So thank you, Jeremy. So with that, I'll turn it over to him. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and good afternoon from Montreal. And uh, you can see my slides, right, Nicole? Yeah? Okay. All good. Okay, thanks. Um, so what I'll talk about is um, something called blockchains and the intersection of blockchains and voting. And um, half of you, uh, a fraction of you probably know why we're talking about this, and I would guess the larger fraction of you have no idea what on earth the blockchain is. And that's perfectly fine. Uh, I'll explain what they are and also why we're sort of zeroing in on this technology to highlight it in its own talk. Um, so before I do, I'm not going to bore you with my CV. I just want to point out that um, I'm sort of maybe uniquely qualified in the sense that I've done academic research on uh, voting, verifiable voting for a long time, 10 years. And uh, I've actually done a lot of academic research on Bitcoin as well. We were uh, some of the first researchers uh, to look at Bitcoin. Uh, I, Right away, you're probably confused, what does Bitcoin have to do with this? Uh, so you'll see that blockchain is related to uh, Bitcoin. Um, it's uh, something that comes out of uh, the Bitcoin system. And so back when Bitcoins were traded for a dollar instead of $800 that they are today, we were doing things like taking election data. Uh, we were running an election in a municipality called Tacoma Park. It's in a uh, suburb of Washington, D.C. And we were putting their municipal election data into the blockchain uh, to achieve certain uh, security properties. And so we've been playing with this technology for a long time. Um, so I'm excited now that I can talk about the intersection of the two, but I'm sort of not that excited because I actually think the intersection is is maybe kind of boring and nuanced and maybe not what people are looking for uh, from the technology, but I'll, I'll get into that uh, in the talk itself. Okay, so what's, what's a blockchain? Um, so a blockchain you can think of as a place to put data. It's kind of like a database. Uh, the main difference is that uh, when you put your data into a blockchain, the people holding the blockchain are a whole bunch of computers, uh, like an entire network of computers, and nobody's in charge of this network. So there's not a central party that's in charge. Um, so this network uh, takes the data, you broadcast your data to the network, and it incorporates it into this structure. You can think of it like a ledger. A lot of people call it a ledger. Um, and once it's in the ledger, it has some interesting properties. So one thing you can do is you can make the computers not just include information in the ledger, but you can make them enforce rules about what's included. So the application of blockchain originally was the digital currency. And so you might be looking at rules like, uh, the person sending this money, are they really the owner of this money? Are you sure that they're not trying to send the money to two places at once, the same coins, uh, that type of thing. So the, the network will uh, enforce these rules for you. The final property uh, is that once it's in the blockchain, and there's some nuance with this, this has to be deep in the blockchain, but we'll sort of skip over the details. Once it's in the blockchain, it's effectively immutable, uh, which is a fancy way of saying you can't change it. Uh, so it can't be modified. Now, you can edit data on a blockchain in the sense that you can post an edit. You can say, okay, look at this record back there. Here's a pointer to this previous record. We want to update that record so it reflects this. But in that case, the whole revision history is in the blockchain. So this is very different than a, a database. In a database, you can go and you can edit a record, and there's no history there. You have no idea that that was edited. You have no idea that that data changed. Uh, in a blockchain, because you can only append data onto the end and you can't change data once it's incorporated, um, then uh, the only way to effectively edit is to leave a, a trail, an audit trail of all the edits that were made. Um, so why are we talking about blockchains? Um, so it's sort of an exciting new technology. Um, there's a lot of interest in it. My more cynical colleagues would say maybe a lot of hype. Uh, that's in, in this area. Uh, there's books like uh, Blockchain Revolution was top of Globe and Mail nonfiction for a while. Uh, you can buy it any chapters uh, that you want. Uh, it's been written and covered in the mainstream media, New York Times, all major uh, you know, media sources have, have uh, done articles on blockchain and how it's changing things uh, that you can watch TED Talks on it. Um, so this has sort of hit like peak mainstream interest right around now. And now everyone's saying, well, what about voting? 
In fact, there's a chapter in Blockchain Revolution about uh, applying blockchains to voting. Uh, blockchains are also, just as a side note, they're being pursued in, by other industries as well. Um, so there's, uh, in the banking industry, I do some work with the Bank of Canada, and uh, they're looking at uh, replacing a, or trying out uh, to see what they can do uh, to uh, experiment with uh, a large value transfer system between the commercial banks. Um, major companies like Microsoft, IBM, they have blockchain in the cloud, so you can just roll with your own uh, blockchain. Uh, there's different financial markets like NASDAQ are looking to, to move security markets onto uh, blockchains. And then there's a bunch of sort of miscellaneous uses, energy consumption, health data, internet of things, and then voting uh, is one of the things that's been in the conversation. Okay, so before we, we jump in, uh, one thing I want to do, and it's always good to do this, if you ever talk to someone about blockchain, you should always get them to define what they mean by blockchain, because I find there's sort of three different definitions depending on what you're, you're talking about. There's hardcore technical people, and for them, blockchain means the data structure that's inside Bitcoin. Anything other than the data structure inside Bitcoin is not a blockchain. Okay, so they'll reserve that term for that very narrow view. Uh, if you go out into industry and you talk to people, they mean blockchain as sort of a code word for any sort of distributed data type. Uh, they call them distributed ledgers. That's a more uh, common term that maybe doesn't confuse it with Bitcoin specifically. Um, but it's, it's basically like Bitcoin's blockchain, but maybe you relax the rules in certain ways or you make some modifications to it. Okay. And then the final thing that sometimes you hear is that blockchains are just... You know, if you take any physical object, you want to make it a digital thing, you're going to use some crypto, uh, you're going to throw some crypto at the problem to do that, then that's all blockchain, okay? Um, and so that's like sort of a third most liberal broad definition of what people mean. And if you use a distributed ledger or Bitcoin's blockchain, whether you do that or not, it doesn't matter. It all falls under the umbrella of this, this idea of, of blockchain, okay? And so just to give you a shortcut or a preview of what I think, I think that last definition is actually fairly promising if applied to voting. Uh, but the first two, um, you'll see, or I'll try and argue that maybe blockchain is not the silver bullet uh, that, that it's been touted to be. Um, so before I jump in on blockchain, I imagine probably no one in the room, maybe a few handful of people have actually used Bitcoin, uh, where blockchains come from. Um, Bitcoin is a payment system. But in terms of payment systems, you probably use online voting, or sorry, online banking. Um, so we can understand a lot of what blockchain gives us by understanding what online banking gives us. And one common question that we get all the time is, well, if I can bank online, why can't I, why can't I vote online? And one thing I'll say is, I think, you know, Dan and, and Alex said the exact same thing. I love the internet. You know, I buy my groceries online. I'm a cable cutter. Um, you know, I think internet voting has the potential to increase uh, voter turnout. Um, I think if you're, uh, uh, for persons with disabilities, internet voting, withholding internet voting where you can use your own assistive technology from home with the setup that you're comfortable with, um, it's almost cruel to deny that. Um, but when I put on my professional hat as a security expert, and I think about the security concerns and how internet voting is, is very different uh, from other things that we do online, I have to say that I'm, I'm very hesitant or I basically can't endorse internet voting at this time anyways with the technology that we've seen. Um, so online banking, uh, you know, it seems very similar on the face of it. There's something at stake, right? Um, I'll be frank with you, I probably care more about the balance in my bank account than I care about the ballot that I cast in any of the last elections in the last 10 years, right? I'd rather one of those be modified than have my bank balance modified. Um, but the difference is for online voting, or sorry, for online banking, first off, I can see if a modification happens. And the banks can see it as well, because the system's completely open. They're running fraud detection algorithms all the time. They often will detect it before I can even detect it myself. If I do detect it from a legal perspective, I have no liability. As long as I'm diligent in how I'm using online voting, or sorry, online banking, I have, I have no liability in terms of uh, things that go wrong. So the bank will just go and they'll fix it and it won't affect me at all. And the banks themselves can probably fix things without much cost incurred uh, to themselves as well because banking transactions are generally traceable and reversible. Um, so this is why, for example, if I go on the black market and I buy a credit card and say there's $1,000 of credit on that credit card, I can get that for about $45, uh, 
because it's so hard to get the money off of that and get it in my hands because everything's traceable and reversible. Okay, now contrast that with online voting. If you have a secret ballot, if you don't have a secret ballot, then you can do internet voting and you can design a very secure system. But if you want a secret ballot, then you have to apply that secrecy at some point. And you, for privacy reasons, you want to apply it as close to the voter as possible. You'd like to have it secret before it leaves the voter's computer. And once you do that, you're basically casting your ballot into a black box. If it's modified, unlike my bank account, I have no idea if it's modified. I don't know where it was modified, I can't tell. The election officials, they can't see the ballots until the final tally is produced. Even then, they can't trace individual ballots, so they don't know if it's modified. Um, and so the whole system, uh, because of the secret ballot provision, that's what's fundamentally different about online voting versus anything else we do online, is the actions that we take, we can't see the results. We don't know what happens, uh, sort of once it leaves our, our provision. Um, so, Let's turn to blockchains then. Um, so most voting systems you know, are going to use some sort of database. Uh, you could use a blockchain instead. And there's some properties that are very favorable for that. Um, so the first thing that a blockchain allows is transparency. So you can trace uh, everything as it goes through the system. This is how Bitcoin uh, counters all the problems that we just talked about. Um, and so you could uh, trace your ballot. You could see that it wasn't modified, that it was uh, counted towards the correct person. Once your ballot was written into the blockchain, you don't have to worry about someone coming along and changing it. And then there's a really fancy property called non-equivocation, uh, which basically says that uh, whoever is, uh, if you hold a database, you can show different versions of the database depending on who's asking. Right. If a voter comes and they're affiliated with one political party, you can show them one version. If an election auditor comes, you can show them a different version. Uh, but with a blockchain, uh, the data structure itself can't equivocate. Okay. Um, now, we'll, we'll talk about in practice what that means because it's, it's not so great in practice. So what are the challenges with blockchain? So those, those sound like really nice properties. It sounds like something that we should do. Um, the first challenge is in terms of secret ballots. The blockchain provides no basis at all or provides no support for secret ballots. Um, and so what you have to do is effectively, if you want to, unless if you want to open the election up so anyone can vote, uh, somewhere along the line, people have to come and they have to register, you know, this is my blockchain address and this is my identity. And whoever's holding uh, that correlation can then go on the blockchain. They can look up how that voter uh, voted. Now, it's possible to layer some security on top, some cryptography on top to eliminate this particular issue. But once you do that, it's not really a blockchain voting system anymore. Um, the second thing is, uh, in terms of openness and transparency, the same thing applies from the candidate's perspective, where they can see the ballots as they come in. So they can see a running tally. Now, some people make a normative argument that this might be an interesting way or an interesting alternative to how it's currently done to explore but frankly, it's illegal today in most jurisdictions. You can't have a running tally. Um, there's also a privacy, uh, big privacy problem with that. If I see you voting from your phone and you set down your phone and say it's an election between Alice and Bob and Alice's tally goes up by one vote as soon as you set your phone down, I basically know how you voted. Um, so we have to think about uh, how we lock down the fact that the tally is open. And to do that, once again, you have to layer so much other stuff on top that it no longer is really a blockchain voting system anymore. Finally, uh, we've heard a lot about uh, malware and also um, going out on the web. Uh, so if you want to see the blockchain, you have to either go through a website, maybe you have a client, but in order to get the client on your computer, you had to go to a website to download it. And so if there's a network attack, um, say there's a lack of SSL or something like that, um, if there's a network attack, then all bets are off. And if you have malware that's coexisting on your computer, all bets are off as well. So any sort of malicious uh, software that you have on your computer could completely change your vote before it reaches the blockchain. Uh, it can also just know how you voted and start showing you, you know, targeted advertising based on how you voted or something like that. Um, so the blockchain doesn't solve that problem at all. It doesn't touch it. Uh, there's some questions about usability. We've raised this in the context of Bitcoin itself, and they apply equally well to, to blockchains. For long, convoluted reasons that I won't explain, you can't really use passwords with a blockchain system. You have to use something that's stronger called a cryptographic key. A key is something you can't memorize. It's something you have. It sits on a computer. 
And when it's sitting on a computer, uh, it's subject to being lost, it's subject to being stolen uh, by malware. Uh, people want to vote from their phone, but the key's on their computer and they can't do it. And so uh, it becomes very difficult uh, from a usability perspective. We've known this for many years because we tried to build email systems uh, based on the same principles and they've never really meet, met, or reached mainstream adoption. Uh, vote selling or coercion, that's something that blockchain can't help you with. Uh, inter any internet voting system, whether you're casting your vote to a database or to a blockchain, uh, you can't do anything about who's looking over your shoulder uh, when you vote. Uh, the final thing is denial of service. This one's sort of a nuanced point. On one hand, a blockchain is a distributed network of computers. It has a lot of bandwidth, has a lot of computational power. Um, but we have seen denial of service attacks against Bitcoin. And, and just this week, we saw one against Ethereum, which is kind of a Bitcoin competitor that uses a blockchain as well. Um, so there's, there's kind of mixed results. And the way they do denial of service is a little more complicated. In fact, Dan's, some of Dan's very earlier research uh, showed these algorithmic attacks, and they're sort of based along that those lines. And so it's possible you could lock down a blockchain uh, to prevent uh, these types of denial of service. And maybe it's more robust than using a content distribution network or what we normally do today. But anyway, right now we can say the results are sort of mixed on that. And that's a real threat. We've seen denial of service attacks against, you know, the NDP leadership election uh, several years ago. There was an attack uh, when they used online voting and we've seen it in other elections as well. Okay, so I want to leave uh, lots of room for discussion and questions, so I'll, I'll just sort of wrap it up, and I'll say a few things. Uh, the first thing is I've argued that blockchains aren't really a, a silver bullet. Um, so they position themselves as a the game changer, but they may serve a role as a component within a voting system, but all the interesting hard problems that you have to solve designing a secure voting system have nothing to do really with uh, the blockchain itself. Um, the second thing is that uh, if you think... Uh, Sorry, Nicole, I can see you mapping something. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, I'll keep going. Um, uh, so crypto, uh, blo blockchain is a, uh, is a way of sort of rolling crypto and voting and combining the two. There's other ways of doing that, and that's very promising. So there's a class of system called end-to-end -end verifiable voting systems. They combine uh, cryptography and voting. Um, these really are a game changer, I think. Uh, and you can see them starting to be reflected in policy. Uh, this isn't just in the academic papers that people are talking about these things. You see it in U.S. guidelines like the BBSG, City of Toronto, and their technical requirements. They mention uh, these as a promising uh, form of system. Um, so um, it, to the extent that maybe blockchain is kind of a Trojan horse just to get people talking about cryptographic audit trails in voting, um, maybe in that case, I would support blockchains because I really think that this, these cryptographic audit trails are important. Uh, but in terms of blockchains themselves, they're just going to play a minority report or a minority position in a blockchain. Uh, and the final thing is, even if you have these cryptographic audited systems, they work very well when you're in person. Uh, but when you move to the internet environment and you don't have control over the person's device, the people standing around the person, uh, then you know they they don't. They don't solve that problem either. Okay, so uh, I'll thank you and I'll take some questions along with Dan and Alex. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. I'm going to upgrade, just in case anyone's wondering. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so yeah, so let's start.